Good day. Um, thank you very much and welcome to our presentations for today, which is actually exam-based conduct classes for 2020. Uh, my name is Maria Shipandeni and I'm your tutor for Natural Science and Health 2. Uh, before I go on a few uh, units that I want us to elucidate on or to go through, I just want to uh, call you to pay attention to the following uh, notes that I consider very important. And this is because most of um, students uh, tend to miss some of these important uh, facts that they need to consider uh, when preparing for exam. So uh, the first point is that you need to pay attention to the learning outcome of every unit of the study guide. I know that in your study guide you have uh, several units and each unit actually consists of, their, of its um, learning outcome. So just pay attention to the learning outcome and as you page through to the next chapter or the next unit, make sure that you understand and you'll be able to, uh, to highlight uh, some of the learning outcomes from that particular unit. I also want to um, uh, ask you to actually pay uh, attention to the instructions and question carefully. Like when you get your question paper, read the instructions and questions very carefully because in some cases, uh, students tend not to read questions carefully and just try to generalize or uh, answer questions um, or, or provide answers that are actually not uh, what uh, the question is all about. As a teacher, you should always be um, able to uh, use practical ex examples when necessary, and this actually helps to strengthen your answers. Yeah, You should be able to um, use uh, or give practical examples. Some questions actually ask you to give relevant examples to actually explain some terms or just um, discuss some 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 some, some uh, topics. So you should be able to use uh, practical examples and those examples should also be relevant to the topic. And also uh, make sure that you read the questions and be able to provide sufficient answers, meaning that you don't have to write too little uh, when you are asked to discuss or elucidate or explain, and you don't have to write too much either. So you should be able to check the marks that are allocated to, to the question and determine the length of your answer. Look at, is it a 10 mark, uh, 10 marks question or is it a one mark question? Then you should be able to answer, uh, to provide sufficient answer based on the marks that are allocated to that particular question. And I know my handwriting is also not the best, but um, try to write as neatly as you can. So I uh, will be able to read um, your answers so write as neatly as as you can and prepare prepare and prepare very well for for the exam yeah having said that now we are actually going to dive into the exam based contact classes and i'm not saying that the exam is actually limited to the topics that i'm going to cover i just want to call your attention to some of, of these these topics you know if, if I have to cover the whole uh, um, module, we won't be able to finish in, in one day or even a week. So I'm just, I just picked out some of the topics that I want you to, um, I want you to pay attention to. The first topic is actually on teaching strategies to promote deep learning. And um, as you know, we need to adjust um, our teaching from the traditional instructional uh, practices to more of the innovative instruction practices to get students to 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 actually just get students to be interested in in learning so the standards or the strategies are actually designed to teach students on how to think we have to make sure that we don't um, just have students who are just capturing what they are taught, but we want to actually cultivate a culture of critical thinking. 
yeah so learners should be able to actually solve complex problems think critically about some tough concept or difficult concepts and they should also be able to communicate their ideas effectively so how can we promote we have, as I mean, I mean as teachers can promote deep learning in lessons. So now we are going to actually look at some of the methods or strategies that we can uh, employ in order to promote deep learning in, in, in classes or in lessons. So one is actually to encourage collaboration, yeah. These uh, collaborations actually promote real-world learning experiences and help students to develop their 21st century skills by encouraging collaboration. So in a way, you should let the students or learners discuss and present their ideas. So you consider points of the, their points of view and make decisions in order to increase their stake in their own learning. So you have to provide them an opportunity whereby they can collaborate with other students and then learn from from each other so you can also this can also be achieved by arranging collaboration with an expert you call in an expert to actually have these kind of uh, discussions with with learners or students or you can also arrange uh, collaboration with other students across the country like from other schools so they can come together and have a certain topic or give a certain topic of discussions where they can they are encouraged to actually uh, think critically yeah you should also use frequent informal assessment to this actually just it's very important to to gauge students um, the, uh, to gauge the effectiveness of, of your instructions instead of just having a, a formal assessment where you have uh, you ask students to go study for a certain topic and then they come in class and write a test you can then inc uh, uh, take up some of the informal assessment so you can also be able to adjust your teaching um, strategies yeah another point is uh, to design lessons with flexible or learning uh, path so you need to have multiple uh, means of engagement presentations as well as expression so you don't just have to stick to one um, uh, design uh, lesson but you have multiple ways of passing on your knowledge to to your learners otherwise it will become boring when you are just lecturing 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 and you don't have these other ways of 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 teaching so you have to design lessons with flexible learning path yeah and another point is um, you, you need to design essential questions to drive learning and your questions should also drive, um, should also allow them to think and critically think and there should be no room for copy and paste. So make sure that you design uh, your questions in a way that the, your learners are, will be able to think out of, out of the box instead of just copying and pasting an, uh, answers. Yeah? Choose learning platforms that provide students with opportunity to express their learning in a variety of ways. That can also be um, online discussions and use uh, technology is nowadays um, like uh, 2020 was quite a, 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 a hectic year where by we had this uh, COVID-19 so with the COVID-19 we need to find another way of passing on our knowledge to students or another teaching strategy so we need to have these uh, ways in, in order to uh, keep on with our teaching. So that is actually also a way of explaining the designing of lessons with a flexible path. path. So on essential questions, I also want you to pay attention to uh, the use of 
uh, Broom's taxonomy as a guide to develop complex questions that require high level of thinking to answer them in, in, instead of just um, or what is or define, you should use uh, other other uh, uh, type of questions of that will actually um, encourage critical thinking. The Broom's taxonomy includes uh, it, it covers from uh, questions that you need students or learners to remember, or it can also be because of they want them to be able to express how they understand some terms or they, are, they, they should be able to analyze or just apply and evaluate as well as create. So in a way, this uh, um, teaching strategies actually help students to uncover knowledge. As you can see in, in this uh, graph uh, figures that I put here, it helps students to uncover knowledge and it also eliminates uh, front uh, uh, eliminate the front of classroom whereby the teacher or the lecturer will just come in and stand in front and teach, teach, teach and go out. So it also then encourage uh, students to collaborate and use of technology as well as I mentioned of informal assessment to provide actually uh, limitations as well as enrichment. Yeah. So with these questions, with this topic or unit, you might be asked to explain or you might be asked to discuss or list some of these um, ways or strategies on how you can promote deep learning in lesson. Or you may be asked to explain how you can carry that or out one of the strategies in, in, in lesson or in your classroom. I also want us to discuss um, the topic on teaching and teaching strategies. This is mainly on teaching methods and how it can be executed successfully. So uh, this uh, previously I, I used to ask um, this question uh, in different ways. Either the person should just probably uh, give out or list these teaching methods or can actually decide on one of the method and discuss how they can actually execute it successfully. So there are actually methods, there are actually several methods that we uh, can use and um, how successful it is depends on how we execute them. So methods to be used by teachers um, it's actually important to enable students to learn and this uh, method that one can choose actually depends on the subject matter that is actually being taught as well as the nature of students. As I said, there are actually several methods and these methods can be uh, brainstorming and we can also use lecturing and that actually also uh, uh, refers to like presentations, just giving a presentation or a lecture to, stu to students or learners. It can also be a case-based uh, a case-based small group discussion or it can be, be, be uh, a demonstration and experiments like where you go to the lab and uh, demonstrate to students how some some concepts uh, like floating and sinking, like why subject, some subjects sink while others uh, float. You can go to the lab and demonstrate or, learn, or carry out an experiment to teach students on, on that concept so they will be able to understand it. It can also be a large group discussion or it can be a role play or games. So, and depending on which method you use, just make sure that um, you pass on this, uh, your aim or learning objective is uh, uh, passed on and students will, will be able to capture it uh, successfully. Apart from that, I also want us to look at how we can support learners with special needs. And um, uh, I know in Namibia we have uh, uh, schools uh, that uh, 
um, accommodate uh, students with special needs, but the, uh, all in all, we, we need to understand how we can actually support learners with special needs. So one point is that um, you should work closely with a special uh, education department and any other aides who might work with that learner, you should, you should work closely with, with, with that uh, department and with those uh, um, associations or organizations who work with uh, such a learner. You should also read the learner's individual education plan to learn what modification that might be needed. Um, and talk to parents and learner and the learner to talk to parents and learn what motivates the learner. So you have to understand your learner. So and some of these can also be captured from actually parents. So you need to talk to parents and learn what motivates the learner. Also allow learner choice in your activities and use brain uh, based learning strategies that stretch their minds and above all be very interested or keen in your encouragement, try to encourage them, focus on your learner's strength and be supportive of their weakness and let learner, let each learner know that you believe in him or her and reward and the rewards will be tremendous for both of you and your learner. So those are just some of the points that you need to take into account to support learners with, uh, how you can actually support learners with special needs, yeah? So with this topic, you might be able, to, you might be asked to describe or you may be uh, asked to list or actually explain or discuss, you may be asked to discuss how you can use one of the method that is uh, highlighted on how you can actually execute it successfully, or maybe just list on, explain how you can support um, learners with special needs, yeah? So, and now we are actually going to talk about self-esteem. Self-esteem is actually a personal overall sense of self-worth or personal value and is actually formed according to a person's value system. Yeah? How much you appreciate or like yourself and how actually how a teenager view himself or herself affect their emotions as a result, it also then affects their behavior. So this is how they actually judge their own appearance, their beliefs, emotion, and actually behavior. So in, in a way, self-esteem is shaped by what learners think, or teenagers think, or adolescents think, or what we think and feel about ourselves, yeah? As we said, it affects our emotions and hence our behavior. So how a teenager view himself or herself, himself or herself affect their emotions. As a result, it affect their behavior. People with, with high self-esteem are more open to new ideas and values and feel more in control of their lives, yeah? And these people, people with high self-esteem, then are, they are more willing to lend assistance. If there's any volunteer geo work or anything about in their community where people just need um, any assistance these people with high self-esteem they are more likely to be in the forefront to to help out they they are eager and willing to lend assistance and do voluntary work yeah however people with low self-esteem um they, they tend to be more prone to develop feelings of isolation and loneliness, yeah? They struggle to make con conversations with other people and they feel tense and awkward in, in social situations. They tend to be withdrawal. They tend to just stay in their, in their little corners and not really communicating or trying to 
or have conversations with, with other people. So adolescents tend to compare themselves with actually the, their peers, yeah? So there are actually factors that may influence a uh, child's uh, self-esteem self-esteem and this actually includes social comparisons as we say they tend to compare themselves with their peers so social comparisons personal achievements peer relationship gender stereotyped expectations culture parental uh, practices as well as changes like for instance they change to a new school or changes in terms of a teacher. These are some of the factors that may influence a child's uh, self-esteem. And, and um, I want to um, actually uh, emphasize on the point that supportive parents, supportive parental behaviors is actually the most powerful factor in the development of, uh, of self-esteem, especially in early childhood, yeah? While talking about uh, this, uh, while talking about self-esteem, uh, also one is to look at the peer pressure and the use of uh, or the abuse of subsistence such as alcohol and drugs. Yeah. So while we are on this topic, um, peer pressure is actually the acceptance by by their peers group is the. The acceptance by the peers group is of the most is of the utmost importance for adolescents. They need to conform to the values and behavioral normal of a certain group. Even though some of these behaviors may be uh, socially undesirable, but all in all, uh, peers or adolescents, teenagers, they need a sense of belonging. They they want to conform to a certain group uh, to to be accepted in, in such certain groups. So peer pressure can be actually negative or positive. We, we do have uh, negative peer pressure, but it can also be beneficial, like uh, positive peer pressure. Negative peer pressure is mostly of the destructive behavior whereby students or learners or teenagers they probably be pressurized into doing things that they don't really want to do. Things, for instance, shoplifting or use of alcohol and, and drugs. That's actually very negative peer pressure. But we do have um, positive peer pressure that might uh, students of the same, students or peers may encourage each other to actually achieve or uh, high grades, for instance. So getting good grades or just cooperating with parents, you know, that's actually very positive uh, peer pressure. So all in all, uh, with this peer pressure, uh, learners or teenagers need to, especially with negative peer pressure, they need to deal with peer pressure. So they need to find ways on um, dealing or assisting uh, peer pressure. I know that it's difficult for teenagers to assist the challenges of peers um, because they want to belong to a peer group, yeah. However, they need to, to actually, they, they need to, uh, first, to, they need, they, however, there is a need to actually assist uh, peer pressure. So it is possible to be um, assertive and be firm without being angry and just stand up and speak out and tell others how they feel and uh, to avoid uh, how they feel. So why they're not doing what they are may, may be pressurized to do. So why they're not in agreement and they can always walk away when they're not in agreement. So we need to teach learners on how they can actually deal or assist uh, peer pressure just by uh, speaking up and standing up for themselves and uh, the, uh, telling them that uh, they don't want to do that, why they don't want to do it. And they can also just walk away, just say no, uh, as you can see there. Uh, they just have to say no if, if it's a no and it should be considered as such. 
But anyway, how can uh, they communicate their boundaries if, uh, assertively? So, setting up boundaries actually take uh, courage. It takes courage and support. So there are actually steps that may be may um, there are actually steps that uh, learners can actually um, follow to communicate their boundaries um, effectively or assertively. And that can be done by actually just acknowledging, acknowledge your own rights without ignoring the rights of others and have respect for yourself and others and uh, listen and talk. So you don't have to be the one up there. You, you should also listen and talk and express a positive and negative feelings. Be confident without being arrogant. So these are just some of the steps that adolescents or teenagers, your learners can actually use to communicate uh, boundaries um, assertively. Just acknowledge your own rights without ignoring the rights of others. Have respect of yourself and others. Listen and talk and have express your feelings, uh, both positive and negative, and be confident uh, without being arrogant and just say no and no should mean no, yeah? So I also want us now to look at alcohol and subsistence abuse. There are actually several reasons out there why people consume alcohol or abuse alcohol, yeah? Some people give excuses of boredom, they are bored and they just want to drink. Some uh, give excuses of or reasons saying that they just want to leave stress, some is because it makes them more confident, like they are going for maybe some interviews or some kind of activities, whatever it is, and they just believe that uh, consuming alcohol will get them more comfortable and then build or they get more confidence. Some drinks because they want to fit within a certain group of their preference and uh, because they want to actually uh, forget about some problems, so that's why they tend to drink alcohol. So there are actually several reasons, and you f if you follow your study guides, you can find some of the reasons why um, people actually abuse or alcohol or subsistence, yeah? But however, on the same note, I would like to say that the alcohol uh, um, alcohol and subsistence abuse actually impact our health, life, and relationships. So we need to take note of that. So you should be able to explain or discuss how alcohol can actually impact um, our health, life, as well as relationships. Yeah. For instance, in case of um, learners uh, they might get a very low performance in school low grades and their behavior in class will be out of this planet uh, they will have um, they tend to have this um, very destructive behavior they will not perform they will be sleeping in class uh, and so forth so alcohol can also lead to diseases and um, because of um, some actions that would not be well thought of, for instance, uh, getting involved in unprotected sex, you can um, um, get uh, diseases, and it can also destroy relationship, like can destroy um, houses, like divorces and, and so forth, and kids in at home not well taken care of because people spend more time at, um, drinking spots like bus and so forth. So those are some of the factors. So you should be able to explain how alcohol can actually impact human health, life, as well as relationships, yeah? And in some cases, I ask you only to discuss how it can impact the health. So not taking into consideration the relationship, but just focusing on health, yeah? So. Having said that, um, school 
can also can actually uh, apart from imparting knowledge schools can also assist in preventions of subsistence abuse by learners so how can you um, as a teacher assist in the preventions of subsistence abuse uh, by learners yeah so you can do this by reducing social acceptability so um, you need to explain to your learners about the health uh, risk as well as safety involved. You can also have uh, organize more activities at school, for instance, sport, and offer treatments and support uh, group sessions to 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 your learners and just have a work with the community. So there are several ways on how you can actually assist in the prevention of uh, subsistence abuse by learners. So you should be able to, to uh, discuss that. So with this um, topic, you may be asked to define, you can be asked to define what peer pressure is. You may be asked to discuss, for instance, discuss how uh, or alcohol and subsistence abuse can impact human health, life and relationship, or how you can actually assist in the prevention of subsistence abuse by learners. You may also be asked to explain how uh, learners can communicate their boundaries assertively. Just some hints, or just mention how uh, learners can communicate uh, their boundaries Assertively. In our next topic is about dealing with emotions. Emotions can actually be experienced um, as positive. Um, these positive emotions are good, uplifting feelings, but they can also be negative, uh, where we are looking at hurtful, depressing, and upsetting feelings. So all in all, we are saying um, that we need to manage our emotions. Teachers have to be sensitive to learners' emotion and foster a relationship of understanding and acceptance. So teachers, um, teachers uh, can actually help their adolescents to, um, to handle their emotions, example, by letting them vibrate verbalize their feelings, let them talk about their feelings. They, uh, we should be able to display a sense of humor, be supportive and provide them with opportunity to cry. Um, the thing of uh, a man should not cry or big boys don't cry, whatever, but be supportive and provide them an opportunity to cry just to uh, express their emotion. Yeah, So providing the opportunity to release the uh, to release the pent up emotion through uh, activity, physical activities like maybe jogging or joining some sport, soccer, and, and something. Just let them have some physical activities. And it's, um, emotions should not be suppressed um, because uh, if we suppress our emotions, sometimes it explodes and um, it will be much more uh, terrible than having them expressed. So with this, we may be asked to discuss or actually just explain. So explain or discuss how a teacher can actually help adolescents to handle their emotions, yeah? And now we are going to talk about food chain and food web, and this is I'm actually just going to take you through this. Uh, the reason why I included it in the presentation is not mainly because students fail to understand the food web and food chain, but it's because uh, they tend to, in, in most cases, if I ask um, them to actually give examples or draw or just highlight on food chain and food web, they tend to just generalize and maybe not take this seriously because it's quite easy and they don't really get good grades good grades on, on this but um, I mean for each question it's very important look at the marks and see if I can't do well on this question then I must do very well on this one so food chain and food web 
it's actually it just represents the feeding relationship yeah who eats who they model how energy and matters involve through the ecosystem yeah with the food chain it follows just one path of energy as animal feed find food so it follows one path of energy as animal find food yeah it starts with a producer the produce organism and it and it ends with the decomposer yeah as you can see in that in that uh, figure you see you have your producer the grass and it's eaten by your primary consumer that's your grasshopper and then you do have the secondary producer that's a frog and the frog is eaten by a snake which is your potential consumer and then it goes to the final consumer which then decomposes yeah and then we do have a, a food web that shows how plant and animal are interconnected in many ways to help them all survive yeah in a connection uh, with food web is actually a connection of multiple uh, food chain yeah with this it actually demonstrate that most organisms eat and they are also eaten by more than one species yeah one organism can eat one or a certain organism and they are also eaten by more than one species so you have um, actually uh, with food web is actually a connection of multiple food chain so what I want you to ask you is like to actually just um, know the difference between the food chain and food web and you should be able to also give examples of, of food chain as well as a well-designed food web in most cases I don't ask for pictures I just want you to write down what eats what So, and the next topic is on the classification of animals. Scientists classify animals into groups based upon on similarity in characteristics. And, and some animals are actually closely related to others. And some animals, I mean, some animals are closely related than others. Although all animals are actually multicellular and they are considered as uh, heterotrophy. So scientists actually, there are actually several criteria that are used by scientists to classify animals into groups. So scientists look at the backbone. So they classify the animal based on the backbone, uh, which is either vertebrate or invertebrate. So your vertebrate organisms um, or animals have actually a backbone and that is for instance fish and birds and mammals so those are your vertebrates and then we have invertebrates and invertebrates are animals that do not have a backbone yeah example insect and jellyfish and others you know so after looking at that after classifying whether the animal has a backbone or doesn't have a backbone then they look at uh, the uh, symmetry um, how the body part of animal are actually arranged. So you have the asymmetric, uh, bilateral, as, bilateral symmetry and lateral symmetry. And I just want you to actually call you to look at this picture here. So you have organisms that have no shape, no defined or definite shape. So this is one group of animals and then you have the largest symmetry this is actually the uh, organisms or animal that uh, their body part are arranged in a circle around a central point like uh, a wheel of a bicycle and this is actually for instance the jellyfish and starfish and you can see in this picture how the larger symmetry uh, animal organisms look like and we have um, another group um, they actually also look at the uh, 
whether the body contains can actually uh, contain two similar halves like these are organisms that will look alike when they are split perfectly down in the middle so one side will be like a mirror image of the other side and this um, you can see in here so one part if it's cut in the middle like half like this you can see that one part will look like a mirror image of the other part yeah after sorting out that they actually also then um, look at the internal features and external features so organisms that are related to each other may have similar internal structure that can actually allow them to live grow survive and actually produce they also they might also have um, similar external uh, features yeah so they now categorize them actually again based on their internal structure or I mean features as well as their external features and then they look at their behavioral pattern your behavioral pattern is actually on how particularly on how they feed so one type of behavior that scientists use to classify is actually on what the organism eat is whether it's a carnivore or it's a herbivore or omnivore depending on what actually they eat so these are actually just several criteria that scientists actually use to classify organisms in in different in different groups so you may be asked to actually just list or you may be asked to discuss how scientists actually use um, how organisms or animals are actually classified into different groups yeah and I would like us to talk about sunlight you know sunlight is a mixture of different colors so sunlight appears white but it can be separated in to a spectrum of colors so this can be done or can be achieved by using a prisma or it can also be achieved by using a compact disc or a drop of oil on water so and as you can see the white light and if separated in different colors you can have red orange yellow green blue it go and violet so by hitting the these colors actually the color of light depends on the wavelength so you should be able to demonstrate um you should be able to demonstrate how the prisma can actually be used to separate uh, uh this white light into different colors and in your uh, study guide it's it's very clear on how you can carry out this experiment or this demonstration to your student and i want us to talk about distillation this is actually a way of purifying water most of our bottles water are actually purified by distillation yeah so in this uh slide you you'll be able to see some of the apparatus that are actually lab equipments or apparatus that are actually used and you should be able to identify them and be able to actually um, discuss their use or mention their use so and then you should be able also to uh, describe or label this uh, diagram of distillation so you need the your light or the banners banner and you need your flask you should be able to actually demonstrate this and such um, distillation can actually be applied uh, at different uh, uh, in, in many commercial processes like for instance in petroleum product when you are distilling water alcohol perfume and essential oil so you should be able to do that I also want us to talk about water so you should be able to discuss basic properties of water phases of water cycle and ways of purifying water yeah and in the same um, topic 
I want you to be able to discuss the benefit of wind, the distinct the dangers of hurricane and storms, and you should also be able to highlight the source of air pollution. This can be burning of fossil fuels, agricultural activities, how does agricultural activities um, contribute to air pollution. It can also be because of factories and industry and mining operation. So you should be able to discuss that. Uh, it's very clear in your study guide. So there is also values of wildlife. So we do have wildlife and this wildlife actually it's very important as it uh, contribute to our economy. So they do have economic importance in through consumptive and non-consumptive use, but they can also present um, they, they, but they are also present a potential for nutritional value. Um, they, they do have ecological roles as well as social cultural significance. So you should be able to discuss how this wildlife actually um, contribute to economy or why they are important. So we do have endangered species. So endangered is actually a species, native species that faces a significant risk of extinction in the new, near future through all or a significant portion of its range. Such species may be declining in number due to threats such as destructions of habitat, or it can be because of climate change or pressure from in invasive uh, species. So our Namibian endangered species uh, include wild dog, black rhino, orib and poku. So you should be able to mention some of those and be able to discuss or explain what endangered species is. So, and then we go through the ecosystem and human activity. So an ecosystem is all the living organism in a particular area, in an area along with non-living or abiotic part of their environment. Abiotic part of the ecosystem includes soil, air, water, um, and uh, forces such as gravity, wind, condition, such as temperature, light, and humidity. So human activity can actually influence the ecosystem negatively, especially when performed in an excessive and unsustainable way. So, and that can be due to agriculture, industry, mining, and fishing. You should be able to explain how agriculture can actually uh, uh, lead to, um, can influence ecosystem negatively. So we can also be able to prevent the destruction of habitat and preserve uh, biodiversity, and some and that can be achieved by reducing or eliminating the use of household chemical and pesticide. Can also be uh, due to can also be by recycling or as much waste as we can. Yeah, reduce the amount of waste that we produce, reduce carbon uh, footprint, and choose feed food that are actually grown locally and grown sustainably. And um, I want us to go through the uh, human body and health. In summary, all human body is made up of 11 important organ systems, including this circulatory system, respiratory, and so forth. So they are actually, uh, in circulatory system, we do have heart, blood, vessels, and where we do have our arteries, vein, and capillary. So you should be able to uh, understand that the heart is the main, uh, the main function is to actually to, pros to propel body, blood, to propel blood uh, throughout the body. So the heart has uh, actually four chambers. You should be able to explain uh, the functions of the four chambers of the heart, as you can see in this, uh, picture here. And also smoking and the lungs. So smoking can actually destroy the tiny hair or, and which actually uh, line the upper airway and protect uh, against infections. When your lungs natural cleaning and repair system is damaged, germs and dirty as well as chemicals from cigarettes can actually um, cigarette from cigarette smoke can stay inside your lung. And, and uh, we talked about 
um, smoking that it can actually permanently damage the alveoles, that is the air sacs of the lungs, and making it difficult to breathe. The smoke can reduce the ability, the ability of the alveoli to actually stretch, which make it hard uh, for you to take in oxygen. It can also lead to lung cancer. Chemical will be trapped in the tissues of your lungs, and the signs of lung damage. Uh, from smoking is feeling out of breath when you are actually uh, walking up um, up the stairs or you feel out of breath it, or it can also uh, one of the signs is also coughing uh, and, and near occurring of chest infection all in all I want you to go through this go through your unit and just read thoroughly and try to understand each and every topic as much as you can. I thank you very much. And in case of questions, uh, please don't hesitate to call me at that number or email me at um, shipandenim at yahoo.co.uk and I will be willing and able to help you. I'm always reachable. Thank you very much.